All right. Well, welcome everyone to our March Town Hall, um, sponsored by the Presbyterian Association of Musicians and the Office of Theology and Worship. We're so glad that you're here. I am Catherine Kupar. I'm the communications specialist for PAM. Um, and I am excited about today's town hall. We have Lim Sui Hong here with us and um, Kim Long to moderate our conversation. So two housekeeping things before we um, get started. Um, most of us are probably more familiar with Zoom than we ever wanted to be. So you're probably aware of the Q&A feature and the chat feature on Zoom. Um, so we encourage you to use that Q&A feature at any point um, to ask a question. Um, and we'll be looking at those questions and hoping to answer as many as possible. And then also use the chat feature um, just to be in conversation with one another so that we can um, all be here together and learning and in community. One thing about the chat um, is you, you might just wanna make sure that it is going to everyone. There's an option to chat just the panelists um, or everyone. Um, so I'd encourage you to chat everyone so we can all be in conversation together. So with that, I will turn it over to our moderator, Kim Long. Hey, I'm so happy to be here today and <clears throat> especially excited to introduce our um, very distinguished guest <laughs> and a dear friend. Um, you know already, Lim Sui Hong is a well-known composer, scholar, teacher, and author. He is the Deer Park Associate Professor of Sacred Music at Emmanuel College, uh, the University of Toronto. Before joining Emmanuel in 2012, Sui Hong was Assistant Professor of Church Music at Baylor University in Texas. And prior to that, he was Lecturer of Worship, Liturgy and Music at Trinity Theological College in Singapore. And before that, he and I were colleagues in the PhD program in liturgical studies at Drew University. He is um, the director for, of music for the 11th General Assembly of the World Council of Churches that will convene in Germany uh, this year. And as if that were not enough, the director of research for the Hymn Society in the United States and Canada. I'm mentioning these things because I think it's, um, it's really germane to the topic of our conversation today. Um, in 2013, Sui Hong was co-moderator of the worship committee for the General Assembly of the World Council of Churches for its meeting in uh, Busan, South Korea. And he was also a member of the worship planning team for the 2011 Ecumenical Peace Convocation sponsored by the World Council and held in Helen, Jamaica. He has chaired um, committees on worship and liturgy for the World Methodist Council and has designed and supervised worship services for the 20th World Methodist Conference in Durban, South Africa. That's um, that's quite an amazing array of events and um, experiences to be part of. Uh, wow, and, and here you are with us today, it's amazing. In addition to being a published composer and uh, a figure on the world stage, he is the author of several books. And maybe you have seen his uh, most recent publication, um, authored along with Lester Ruth, A History of Contemporary Praise and Worship, Understanding Ideas That Shaped the Protestant Church. So um, we are going to um, hear from Sui Hong for a little while, and then I'll get us started with a couple of questions and then open it up um, for you to be able to take part in conversation with our guest. I'll turn it over to Catherine for a moment. Before we hear from Sui Hong, we um, gonna begin our time together um, with a short, video. Remembering Ukraine and her people, we open our time together with a song, Healing for the Nations.
you, Catherine. Thank you, Kim, for the wonderful introduction. That's too much. <laughs> I'm just a regular guy, a musician, you know. And 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 thank you so much for the kind, very very kind introduction. Um, so I'm my clock is ticking. I have nine minutes to tell you what this essay is all about, and I'll do that. All the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, my essay focused on the work of songs in the process of reconciliation. That was what was given to me um, as something to consider. So I want to first say that songs have many functions in the context of Christian spirituality, such as a, 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 a way of doing corporate praise, a way of doing personal devotion, or even a credo or a proclamation uh, approach uh, in terms of Christian spirituality. Very often, we do not really hear about this prophetic dimension that I would like to focus on. So in this particular essay, I look at the prophetic dimension through its ability, through the song's ability to challenge us in taking up the process of reconciliation. Why do I do that? Well, I think it is important for us to keep in mind that the work of reconciliation is one of our existential ministries as Christians in the world. Um, if you have your Bible handy with you, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 21, it is very clear uh, what Paul's write about our work as Christ ambassadors and the ministry of reconciliation. Now, this work of reconciliation is, it is always ongoing. It is not a one-time event. It is not a, well, one... Uh, one day of a week kind of thing, but it has to be a lifelong event so long as we breathe this air and live on this earth. So in my essay, I quoted uh, a United Methodist minister, Brian Tillman, who reminds us, and it is in, this essay, in the essay, reconciliation must always be pursued in a working relationship. Therefore, justice should never be the goal. Justice is the means to the goal. The goal is community. When I use the word reconciliation, he says, this is what I mean. Reconciliation is not something we hold hands and pray to God to do. No, no kumbaya. It is the work that God has given to us to do. I think that's very important for us to keep that in mind. It is the work that we as Christians must do. It's not something that we pray and expect God to handle the situation. Um, so in this essay, I showcased uh, music and songs from various contexts that offered an insight into reconciliation. Um, I had examples from South Africa, uh, examples from the praise and worship movement in, in the Promise Keepers. If you ever heard of the Promise Keepers, that was very big um, in, not, in the US, there's a song from there too. Um, what you need to do to access this music is to look for the the YouTube links that are embedded in the essay. Type that out on your computer under youtube.com and you can find the music. And I encourage you to make that little effort and you will be rewarded with various different kinds of music from these various different contexts. But for this particular session today, I want to showcase two songs uh, from two different contexts. And the first idea is a song by Stuart Townen. Uh, and his music is called Kyrie Eleison. Let me give you a little bit, back, bit of background. Um, we all know Keith and uh, Keith Getty because he, we think that he's the one who wrote In Christ Alone. And that one has history with PCUSA, yes? Uh, but what you need to know is that one of the principal writer is actually Stuart Towner. He is actually the, the theological brain in the writing uh, team. Uh, Keith Getty does the music quite a fair bit, and Stuart Townsend actually does the words. And so in this particular case, uh, when you hear Kiri Eleison, you need to under hear him writing both text and music, uh, which is very interesting take. His musical style is very different. So I'll invite Catherine to play us uh, this particular YouTube clip. Thank you. 
we come, as we come before you with the needs of our world. We confess our failures and our sin. Thank you, Catherine. What I want you to hear, if whether you were able to catch it, if not, go get the clip and listen to it again. Stuart Townham had this lyric line, for our words are many, yet our deeds have been few. Fan the fire of compassion once again. I'm not sure how many of us realize, but uh, in the work of reconciliation, there are lots of papers. There are lots of speeches, but do, does, do all these work, uh, words translate into action? I think that's something that we need to address in the work of reconciliation. Don't just talk. Do the work of reconciliation. It is one of the toughest things to do in life, but that is our mandate. That is our calling as Christians. And I think it is important for us um, to keep that in mind. Um, then, because I'm based in Canada, uh, I happen to know a very good friend. I got to know this very good friend, a Mohawk Christian singer-songwriter, Jonathan Maracle. Um, And it was a providential event. I was finishing up the essay, and I could not find a song that speaks about the Canadian situation. And then, I would call this like maybe at 11.59, before my due date of midnight, Jonathan sent me this song. Look, here's a song that I just created and I want to share that with you. So can I invite Catherine to just play it for us? My father went to residential school and during that time he was very mistreated and before my father died in 1999 he called me to come to his home because he had something to tell me and he said son someday there's going to be a discovery that takes place in Canada he said and when this discovery is uncovered he said it's going to change the way this nation is he said it's going to change things I thought of that so many times as uh, when I wrote this song two days before the discovery of what took place in Kamloops, all those memories came rushing back to me that that was what my father was talking about. And I believe God has given us as Canadians and as First Nations people both an opportunity to get it right and to see healing happen in this land. You will haya, 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 We're here to honor you, we're gathered here by love To honor life, the sacred gift you breathe into us As the sacred fire burns, the fragrance fills the air The sun comes up, 
In the east and our prayers rise to you Our prayers rise to you We sing, we dance, we wear For healing in our land We sing, we dance, we wear For healing in our land Healing in our land Thanks, Catherine. So, to sum up very quickly, Reconciliation, as I said earlier on, is hard work. But I believe that when we participate through song, through singing, we are actually embodying God's message to the world. For this is a task that we cannot and must not neglect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sweehan, thank you so much. You're, um, when you first started speaking, you mentioned the prophetic nature of um, of of what of what you're talking about and the the music that you're talking about and um, that certainly is resonating as as we listen to both your comments and the music that you're playing. Um, it occurred to me as as um, as the clips were playing that it, your very method of um, having us hear music that are across genres um, is in, it, in itself modeling, you know, one, one way of uh, working for reconciliation, I think, um, simply to, to, to hear, hear songs we might not hear or seek out songs we might not necessarily um, seek out from contexts that are different from our own. When we, yeah. first, oh, go ahead, you wanna say something? Yeah, I, I, I think for the longest time in North America, when we, when we talk about songs from different cultural contexts, we only reserve that for World Communion Sunday. So one of the things I want to push the envelope is we cannot do that. We need to have songs from different contexts from around the world permeate all our worship services because mm -hmm. they all have stories to tell. They all have different functions. And... And if we really take our Christian spirituality seriously, we need to hear their stories and see mm -hmm. how that challenge us to be better Christians. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, it, and, and the cultures, there are even different cultures within one country. Yeah, yeah that's right. right. <laughs> so I mean, we don't have to look very far. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But yes, I, I completely agree with your point about um, you know, seeking, seeking out songs all around the world. You know, when we first started talking about um, your writing this article, I remember you getting in touch with me a couple weeks later and saying, I got nothing. I'm not <laughs> anything. And then I, I can't exactly remember what our, how our conversation went, but, but it, you changed your, you changed your um, process. Um, Right. And that sort of opened things up for us. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm, you're right. When I was write, writing this particular essay, I was struggling because I was locked in a particular mindset. Well, you know, uh, uh, in the Canada context, we are talking about uh, recon reconciliation work between settlers and first or indigenous people. Mm -hmm. That was all I was thinking about. And, and, and I was really struggling. Like, How do I do that? Okay, let's look at South Africa. Well, South Africa also had a Truth and Reconciliation Movement. Uh, this right. was in 2005, I think, if I'm not wrong. And I know from Southeast Asia, we had the Cambodian Khmer Rouge trauma genocide, and they also had the Truth and Reconciliation Movement. Mm -hmm. So basically, there are three main uh, historical markers about reconciliation. But then when you wrote to me, you said, I quote, I, I found the quote, do feel free to discuss songs from a variety of contexts or even suggest ways of repurposing other hymns or songs with reconciliation in mind. And that was like a light bulb that came on for me. Because then we are not looking for songs that must have the keyword reconciliation. Mm. And that opened up the doorway and I, be, and I discovered Stuart Townend's song, Kyrie Eleison, 
where our words are lost, but our actions are few. And that struck a chord in me to say, mm -hmm. this is something that needs to talk about reconciliation, the process of reconciliation. It's not just about publishing 500 pages of papers about it, but actually doing the work. Yeah. And so that opened up the mindset of how I can actually explore. And then when we talk about repurposing, then I discovered another song, which was The Promise Keeper, uh, which is a very praise and worship kind of approach. And they're also talking about reconciliation. All right, that's another possibility. And so your email with that sentence, repurposing our hymns and songs with reconciliation in mind, really opened up the gateway for me to explore various options that are out there and to, and to listen what are the threads of reconciliation that weave through these songs mm. that may not have the explicit word, but they convey the same message. Mm -hmm. So mm. it became very important for me. And, and that's why we could find all this song. And so the, the capping of the essay came when I received this song from Jonathan Morocco. It's 11.59 before I had to submit the essay. I remember that. <laughs> it was like, that was yes, dramatic. That's a, yeah. So it was literally to me, literally providential, God sent yes. that came mm -hmm. in because there are not many songs out there uh, be, from the indigenous community because the tension is still there. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the tension yeah. still exists and you don't find them saying, look, we, we can have something common. Right. It's still not, it's still very raw. The, and particularly mm -hmm. with even more cases of unmarked grace that are being discovered um, it's still very difficult for the indigenous community to be able to say, okay, let's, let's have a conversation. Because the moment you talk about reconciliation, we don't talk about, okay, what are the, what are the things that require for reconciliation to be sealed, right? There, 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 uh, are, are there compensation issues? Are there discussions about consequences? Are there discussions about penalties? Nothing. Nobody dares to go into that minefield at the moment. So it mm -hmm. is a, a long road. I mean, and if you look at North America and if you look at the US, it's the same thing. There are many issues mm -hmm. that are under the carpet. Nobody dares to open up, lift up the carpet because it is a can of worms to even it's, talk it's about. And painful, painful. Right. And, and right. Um, nobody, nobody knows how to do it right. gracefully, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, you know, it's... Yeah. By you were struck by the by the words word action um, piece of the um, town and song, mm. and I was struck as well by um, how much that the verse sounded like it sounded like liturgy. It sounded like a prayer of confession that might right might be in one of our books. Uh, right, it is actually, kid. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, Kyrie lays on. <laughs> No, he took it from the Book of Common Prayer, the Anglican Church. Well, no wonder. <laughs> so I, that, that's the reason why I featured him because he is he in Christ alone. It is a very reformed theological approach, and it is his words. But in this particular version, he has gone back to the ancient church, Anglican Church, Book of Common Prayer, and he wrote a song from there. So that like, okay, so this guy is not purely praise and worship style. He he has a breath in terms of his musical writing style. And the music, yeah. if you listen, is not purely praise and worship. There's no band and loud guitars. It starts with a djembe or some, some kind of African rhythmic fe fe uh, feature that I can hear. And then his melody is pentatonic. Oh, come on. It's, it's almost like <laughs> world music. So, <laughs> so it's a good listening <laughs> To yeah. blow people away, just like, oh no, it's a different. Yeah, right there, it's breaking mindset. down, all, breaking down the <laughs> and barriers, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, just in that that one song. Yeah, and and we we think that contemporary praise and worship has shallow theology. Is a book of common prayer here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I hear it. Um, you know, I, you've you've already touched on this, but um, I wanted to in invite you, if, if you want to, yeah. to talk a little bit even more about um, um, where songs come from. I mean, you, you tell the story in your article, you tell stories about where songs are from, um, and you've done it here um, with the, the two clips that you've showed us. 
um, how telling a story of, of where a song comes from or how it emerges enlarges our understanding. And um, I just wonder if, you, if there's anything else that you would like to say about why knowing the context of our songs matters so much. Yeah, thanks for the question, Kim, because I think it's important. Uh, I teach hymnology, okay, some background. I teach hymnology at Emmanuel, and, uh, and part of the, the hymnology approach I've taken is a historical and contextual approach. And one of the songs that one of the songs that are popular in Canada is Sia Hamba. Mm -hmm. And you have everybody loving this song. We are marching in the light of God. We are, you know, and, and there's this strong beat, you know, and it, it, yes, it's an upbeat song, it's a, it's a happening song. But they do not understand the background of this particular song, where it came from. Mm -hmm. And then I will tell them, look, this song is a song that is sung by protesters in the period of the anti apartheid movement, where you, this song is meant to strengthen the courage of the people who are facing police across the street. Yeah. And they are marching towards the police and they are singing this song. Now, put yourself in that. Would you be dancing with this song? Right. So immediately, the whole mindset changes in terms of how can this song be sung. Yeah. Right. Then another song that I like to, to talk about is um, I, I have a setting for E Servants of God. Uh, and the, the tune that I wrote that has a very strong uh, triple meter to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And People don't realize this, but if you really look into the history of E Servants of God that Charles Wesley wrote, it is so called a, 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 a banner waving song for the Methodists in his time because it was a song for rarely cry when they are pelted with rotten eggs and rotten apples. It is a song that defines who they are as Methodists. So it is a kind of it's a battle cry song. And yet yeah. in our churches, we sing it with such funeral feel to it. That's not a battle call song. Come on, give me a break, right? I mean, you need to really get the people going to, okay, we're going to go into war and, and well, uh, uh, against the other side of, of, yeah. of, of the people who are, who, are, who are putting them down, right? Uh -huh. And so in my version, I actually inserted the Alleluia at the end. So it's, it's kind of a rally cry. You know, praise God. This, yeah. is, this is our, our call to do this particular work. Yeah. So all this context, if we are music directors, we really need to understand the stories behind the song because they inform us and shape our spirituality. They, they shape the way and define us eventually uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how we use these songs to shape our Christian formation and our spirituality and our identity in the yes. midst of the situation that we are facing. Right? Yes. Um, it's the reason why I began our session with the song, uh, mm -hmm. Praying for Ukraine. Because I think that particular one with the text by Fred Kahn speaks very clearly. We, are, we need to stand in the world and hold on to God's worldview so that we are not shaken by the news that we are hearing of the trauma and the destruction that's going on in that land. We need to stay hopeful yes. and we need to pray and stand in support of people who are suffering. I think that's so important. That's part of reconciliation, I think. Amen. Amen. And he's a preacher too. There you yeah, go. that's right. <laughs> you. <laughs> Pre preachers write good song texts. I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, it's seriously though. Uh, you know, you're saying music directors need to know this, but these these stories and to convey them. But you know, this is what a what a great way for preachers to be able to um, also be able to share those stories and to understand how um, how you know the sermon is tied to everything else that's right. going on in the liturgy. It's not just like this yeah. the thing that gets like, you know. Yeah, exactly. You know, dropped I, down I, into the middle of everything. Yeah, I mean, I will encourage, I, I know that seminaries in the US have dropped the course on hymnology or congregational song. I think that's a bad mistake. They need to recover that, not just learn the hymn tune names. That's not what we are talking about, but yeah. learn the stories of the songs because they will inform the spirituality of our MD people trying to be pastors yeah. um, and how they, they learn how to use the songs to strengthen their preaching and mm -hmm. strengthen the, the worship service that will shape the lives and the spiritual lives of the people. I think that's so mm -hmm. critical. Yeah. Well, and some of our seminaries never had those courses to begin with. <laughs> 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 or it's a, uh, sometimes an uphill battle. 
and I, oh, yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I agree with you completely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, thinking about your bio again, and, um, you know, from thinking of you as being from Singapore and uh, shivering in Toronto, <laughs> <laughs> getting there by way of Texas, <laughs> you know, these this wide range of contexts in which you've lived and worked. Um, you know, has that affected your, your, um, your work? I mean, has it affected your views about these things? I mean, you've, you've kind of had to put your, put your body in, you know, in places that are foreign to you. <laughs> okay. Space, that, that's probably. <laughs> Let's go back to, to the, the basic thing. Why did I move from Singapore to Waco, Texas, and then to Toronto? And I can tell you that one of the primary motivating factors for this shift, and mind you, I have to drag my family along, mm -hmm. is this sense of vocational call. My call, as I, as I know it, is to give voice to God's people in their worship of God. And it moves from wherever I'm serving. And so the idea is that in what context, I mean, wherever God places me, I say, um, my, my, my task is to give voice to God's people so that they can worship God in their voice. Mm -hmm. And so that's the idea that, that I'm, I, I live and work out of. And mm -hmm. so for me, I see my call of moving from place to place is God's appointment. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. So in that sense of when I move from Singapore to Waco, that's what I'm, I'm supposed to do. Wherever I am in the midst of the people, my question to them is, what is the voice that God has given you to sing his praise and to proclaim his love? That's a question that I ask. Um, I remember my first interview uh, at Emmanuel. Um, I asked the people who gathered there, you are United Church of Canada. What is the song that God has given you as a church? Yeah to sing mm. God's praise and to proclaim his love. And that was an interesting question because uh, the first song that was in the hymnal is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. To me, it's like, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. That, that was a, so that was, so my move has, has been adjustments to different contexts, but the mission remains the same. What is the voice of God's people in this particular context? What mm. might be what might we sing? Um, and you can find that in the way that I do my ministry in Asia. I still go back there and the, and the work that I do in North America. In North mm -hmm. America, you notice my, my latest book is A History of Praise and Worship. And this is right. a big deal here. It Perhaps is a big in deal. Asia, in Asia, my main focus is to teach them what has God given you to be able to sing God's praise. And try not to look to the West because we are always looking to the West. Right. What is our own voice? Yes. And so that's the attempt for us to develop our own, own particular voice as well. Mm. Mm. Now you understand how I... Yes, thank you. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> so I realized, because I'm so excited about talking with you, um, I realized that I'm hogging the time and I haven't asked other people to... <laughs> to it's okay. Questions. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> I, I will I will stop talking for a moment and uh, just ask if there are other people. I'm I'm looking at the chat. Catherine is helping us look at the chat as or the Q and A or whatever those. I, mean, I guess there are two things. Um, so let me open it up. I mean I I I have lots more things I can talk to Smyong about, but I don't want to um, I don't want to be greedy. Yeah, I, I see uh, David Gambrell's note about uh, uh, movement to pay royalties and reparations for use of spiritual uh, in worship. You're yeah, right. There is a need for reparations for, because justice is part of reconciliation movement. Um, but more than that, I mean, right now there's an ongoing discussion that I know the Him Society is going to be talking about is copyright. How do we deal with copyright from songs that we, we, we enjoy singing, particularly from the global south, Oso mm -hmm. So and uh, Sia Hamba? How do we deal with that particular copyright? Because the world of copyright is very different. There's a, uh, 
both in North America as well as in the global south. It, it is, there's a whole lot of discussion that needs to go on. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, several years back, I had a conversation with Dave Dagi. Uh, Dave Dagi is a Roman Catholic priest who was based in South Africa and he transcribed a lot of music um, and they were published. What he has done much uh, ahead of time, actually, from him, was that he set up a trust fund in South Africa. And so that even though he's the one who transcribed the music, all the money that he that publishers sent to him because he's a transcriber, mm -hmm. he would forward the money into this trust fund in South Africa with the Lumco Institute, and then it is disbursed to the community. Now that's amazing work because that is that nobody is. thinks about that, right? Because right. who who's a point person in North in, in Europe or North America who can manage all this? Because publishers don't have the time nor the ability to track down how to do this. But because he was formerly based in South Africa, he knows the people and he yes. has a way of getting the institute to set up a trust fund. So that was a way of going forward to do this. Yeah, that's good to know. And uh, a good story to, you know, you know keep telling that story and you never know where it, you know, a seed is going to drop and right. thing else will grow. Yeah, yeah. So so we, we, we try to do that, right? I mean, and I think that's one way that we need to understand North America that the copyright world is very different outside of North America. Mm -hmm. I think that's important to keep in mind. And we need to find ways to, to help them figure a way out that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so question from Chi Yi. Oh, Chi Yi. Yeah. Um, it, it, Good question. Uh, we do not know yet. So right now, what we can do is by word of mouth, if you are, in, if you are singing songs from South, Af from South Africa, particularly if you find that the word is, trans or the music is transcribed by Dave Dargi, D-A-R-G-I-E, then you, you can pay royalty as per normal because the royalty will then be received by him and automatically remitted to South Africa. He has this system in place already. Mm. Other places are not so clear. So it is still an independent movement uh, of how this is done. Um, David Gamble wants me to repeat the question. Uh, the question was, how do we find this trust fund for paying the royalties? Where can we find resources? Um, and so Dave, Dad, uh, Dave Dadji is a retired Roman Catholic priest, now based in Germany. And he has this system in place uh, to do this. I bet, he, I bet he'd tell somebody else how to do it if they asked. Yeah. <laughs> I have, you, if you really want to contact Dave Daji, let me know. I have this email. You can just email him in Germany and he, he can show you how to do this. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. I don't know if that's... The, the other option which you may want to consider is most denominations have mission organizations or missions department. And they do have embedded missionaries in the field. Now, if there's a way in which, let's say, for example, the Presbyterian Church, if there's a way in which the mission organization within PCUSA has somebody in the field, they can set this kind of arrangement up. Oh, uh, yeah. It yeah. is possible. It too. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult. You can support the missionary that is there. Right. Uh, which is what I do with some of my music. Some of my music are published with GBGM, the General Board of mm -hmm. Global Ministries of the mm -hmm. United Methodist Church. Now, GBGM is a missionary organization. Mm -hmm. My royalties actually goes to fund mission work within GBGM. So mm -hmm. any music of mine that's copyrighted under global praise goes mm -hmm. to support missionaries, Methodist missionaries mm -hmm. all over the world. That's mm -hmm. another way. So talk yeah. to your mission board. <laughs> that's a great thing to do. That's a great thing to do. Thank you. Yeah, and it's not difficult because every denomination will have their mission board and, and mm -hmm. just work it that way, you know? Yep. That might be, you may have just answered um, G's question. How about the Asian church? How about Asian church music? Um, Asian church is still very, is still very uh, loosey-goosey or still unclear at the moment because there's no central group that's actually helping to, to collect uh, revenue or to deal mm -hmm. with copyright on its own. Um, so most of the time, in terms of Asian church music, 
you either go to Itolo or you come to me and we will help you na navigate the way through the, the system. Uh, because we do know people, various leaders of denomination, and they will actually be able to help you to do this. That's a generous offer. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, just I'm concerned about this. It's a justice issue. So. Yes, well, but thank you. You're, you're, you're not just saying the words. <laughs> no. Um, while we wait uh, to see if anybody else has a question for you, I'm, I'm just curious about what it's like to, um, and you can say as much or as little about this as you want, <laughs> what it's like to be on, um, you know, be planning a worship and music for, a, you know, something like a, a world council of churches or, um, a, you know, other denominational international organization. Yeah. What is that like? What what have you learned from yeah. it? Yeah, what I learned from it. Uh, you can answer one, it either way you want. <laughs> okay, I, I think uh, how I came to do this, uh, came about to do this was uh, I was invited to, to serve as the music director um, in 2014 uh, mm -hmm. after the, the 2013 Busan Assembly. Um, and so I knew from that point, uh, at that time, that there are 350 different denominations in the World Council of Churches. So you are navigating various theological positions. Um, there's no agreement on communion, uh, how you celebrate it, how you actually operate. The whole theology behind communion is also debatable at that point. Uh, you, you are looking at people from one end of the Orthodox uh, Eastern Christianity on the other end, the extreme end would be the Pentecostals on the other side of the fence. So you, we basically have to ne negotiate all this uh, approach in terms of our mu music making. Now, being the music director basically means I have to facilitate conversations. I have, a, uh, I have other people who are appointed to this particular committee uh, from all shades of denominations. Reformed Church, uh, Pentecostal, Charismatic, all kinds. And we all come together and we basically work on how do we express the theme in terms of music making. So the first thing that we had to receive was a theme. And so the theme that they had in mind was, was also focused on reconciliation, which is what we had to do as well. And so from there, we, we began to share resources. Um, so since 20, I would say 2019, we started meeting as the group, about 24 of us. Uh, over, over up to now, we have multiple meetings, one in person, and then the then it went online because of COVID. And so basically in that time, we brought as much resources as we can from our background. There's also been a call of search for new music. So we have to process all this material and then lay them out and see how the services come together because every day there are different sub-themes from the assembly. And we basically work our prayer, our worship, and the songs into that particular, into that particular theme. That's the way that we did it. That wow. Way. It's a lot of work, Kim. That sounds <laughs> absolutely overwhelming, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, yeah it, it, it's different from when my involvement with the World Methodist Conference or Council, because we are all mm -hmm. Methodists. It's okay. Right. There's, there's, there's some semblance of uh, uh, unity there. But World right. Council of Churches, no. And we had to consult different voices, mm -hmm. and it is world. So they, are, the, they divide the world into eight different regions. So every service that we create need to have music from as many regions as possible. Wow. So you, you cannot just say, well, we're going to sing all songs from Europe. That's not going to happen. You actually have to, we actually have a spreadsheet that says, okay, for this service, these are the different regions represented. So it's like, yeah, it, it's a lot of statistical work, actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's math involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We map everything, right? So it's like, and then certain, <laughs> and we, we scrutinize the text because certain texts, if a particular denomination finds it objectionable, then it mm. cannot be included. Mm. Yeah. So we steer clear of things like communion and table, things like that. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing yeah, they, you can sing anything at all. Pardon me? It's amazing you can sing anything at all. 
<laughs> yeah, so maybe, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. So we basically go back to the Bible. Everything is scriptural based. Mm. So we use the words of Jesus. We use we find songs that articulate or or open up the the scripture. That's the only way we go. And then we have short songs like Kyrie's. Um, that those are possible, right? The Nicene Creed, that's possible, things like that. Yeah, David I is right, it's like putting together a hymn now. <laughs> Just that this is over like eight, eight to eleven services that we have to do. Yeah. Uh-huh. And and you have disagreement within the committee because we are all coming from different denominations background. So it's not like okay, we are all PC USA, we are on the same page. No, this is like mm-hmm. you you don't get that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, boy, I just thought of a really good question, but it's too big for right now. Um, <laughs> but someday, not we can chat. But someday, I really want to hear. I mean, this is a longer conversation. I see it's like almost two o'clock already. But um, um to be in a conversation with you about um, post-colonialism and. Yeah. And worship and and music. That's um, oh, that's a that's my hot topic. Yes, cannot yes. five minutes. We cannot do this. No, we can't do it in five minutes. No, so um, <laughs> we're going to create another opportunity to be able to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure, of course. As yeah, it's um really we really need to be paying attention to that. Yeah. Um, it's since we're getting close to the end of time, um, end of our time, I um. Just happened to notice on Facebook um, the other day that you posted um, a composition of yours, Dona Nobis Pachem, in response yeah. to um, what's happening in the world on the other side of the world, yeah. um, or all around the world um, these days. And I wondered if you would tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I will. I will talk a little bit about the background, and then I'll get Catherine to play the little clip, kind of end up our time together. Um, back in 2014, I, uh, I started writing tunes bef- before there were words. Um, it started because uh, the song as the wind song. I'm not sure whether you know that song. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the first case where I wrote the tune and then I sent it to Shirley Marie, a good friend, and said, look, mm-hmm. Shirley, I got this tune. I need some words, right? Can you help me out with this? And so she crafted the words in two weeks and then I got a nice, nice text from her. And so that partnership continued. And so this particular song that you heard, Dona Novis Pascham, uh, was the same idea. I, mm-hmm. I created Dona Novis Pascham, the first, the, the chorus, the refrain first. And then I sent it to Shirley. I said, look, Shirley, this is a prayer that I would like for it to be prayed. Can you find the stanzas for me? And so two weeks later, she came back to me with two different sets of words. Oh, so wow. if you go to Hope Publishing, there are two different sets. One, one set she, she, she labeled, she entitled it Inner Peace. And then the other, the other set of words, she called it World Peace. So mm-hmm. what you saw on Facebook is the World Peace version. Got it. Uh, so that was how the song came about. The, the chorus came first with the tune and there were no, no, lyrics, no stanzas. And she crafted two different sets. So if, if your listeners are interested to find it, go to Hope Publishing and Google Dona Nobis Pachem on Hope Publishing website and you'll find the, the thing that you can actually listen to it. So over to you, Catherine. Can you play the clip, please?
Thank you, Catherine. Um, for the rest of the stanzas, you can go to Hope Publishing and look for it there. It's there. Uh, Hope Publishing also has a score so that you can actually use it as well. I hope that helps, Kim. That's it's so wonderful and so timely. And thank you for um, sharing it with us. I have a feeling that, that that's going to be sung in a lot of our churches in the coming weeks. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. my pleasure. Yeah, because I was, I, I was quite... Uh, I struggled with the Ukraine situation. Mm -hmm. And so the Dona Nobis Pachan was the thing that came to my mind. I said, well, I think we can do this one. Um, yes. I, I don't have a good singing voice. So I just put the melody onto the computer keyboard. Like, well, let's try this. Anybody can sing this now. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh. It's, um, oh, let's see. There's a note from Dave. Yes, that's right. It's published in my collection, Faith, Hope, and Love. Oh, good. Good to know. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, David. Absolutely. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Just a little note. Right now, there is a song that I, with a hymn tune called Mandalay Girl, which I wrote um, using uh, Dan Damon's text. Uh, that came about because of the shooting in Myanmar, where uh -huh. a teenager girl that was, that was there was shot in the eye by... by Burmese soldier. So mm. I named the tune after that particular incident. Yes. So yeah, and that was right now in the system at Hope Publishing. Hopefully it will come up sometime soon. So yeah, so so for me, the whole justice <laughs> issue is not just, oh no, feel sad, but we need to do something about it. And I hope through the gift of music that I have a little bit of, that we can all sing about it and really do something about it. I think that's so important. Mm. So I welcome your, your challenge to write this essay, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, um, I, gosh, it's been absolutely um, delightful to talk with you. Um, I always learn from you. I'm always just so grateful for the many, many gifts that, that you give to the church um, all around the world. Uh, what, a, what a treasure you are. Thank and you. Thank you. I, you have so many demands on your time and I'm so grateful that you um, took the time to write, write the article and took the time to talk with us today. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, Kim. Anything for you, but don't tell the world. <laughs> Anything for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Catherine, do you have anything you need to say? I don't think so. Just thank you all for coming. And um, the town hall series will take a break in April, but we'll be back in May. Um, so watch for more details about that to come. So we'll see you all um, in May. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Peace. Be well. Bye-bye. <laughs>